and initially set about embedding myself in the Ethereum NFT community. Um, this was early 2021, um, but I never really felt at home, never really felt like a part of anything. So I, I heard about Tezos and, and tried tried producing work on the Tezos blockchain. I had a, a couple of sales, um, but again, it, it didn't really gel. Around the same time uh, that I was looking at Tezos and sort of considering other options, NFTs on Cardano was starting to um, gain traction. Um, so from there, I, I started ingratiating myself with people in, in the Cardano community, um, particularly uh, Entheos was was one artist that I discovered, um, and he he sort of helped me out quite a bit early on. <clears throat> we used to chat about AI. There were there were about sixty people in his Discord channel, uh, Discord server at that time, um, and his was actually my first Cardano NFT. He put me on his. Um, I think he had a, a channel promoting other artists at the time and put me on there, and I started to get a bit of recognition. Uh, so I started offering up pieces that I had for sale on Tezos. I sort of said, I'll burn it on Tezos if anyone wants to buy it on Cardano. Um, and things started building from there. And, and it was really before there were any mass minting services. So I was doing things uh, one at a time <clears throat> using uh, Metro Mermaids, uh, which was run by the Tails pool. Uh, yeah, just sort of speaking one-to-one -one with buyers uh, and everything was done on trust. Um, so you know, they, they'd send me the payment and then I'd mint the NFT and send it back to them. And it's sort of a, a personal engagement that I, that I miss quite a bit because you've got to speak to every buyer. Um, but I, it's, it's still nice speaking with buyers, but obviously you don't have that, that interaction with every single buyer anymore. It's, it's sort of the first place I've felt at home and I've not really looked back since, since working here. There was already a lot of high profile artists there and it was it was harder to crack um, and perhaps my personality wasn't wasn't a right fit um i i'm not really sure to be honest um i'm i'm quite glad that it didn't work out though um because i wouldn't have ended up here today But yeah, I mean, the art on Tezos is is fantastic, and a lot of it is built around um, creative coding as well. When I was selling my my work, there were no platforms like um, FX Hash, which is all geared around creative coding and producing uh, larger collections using um, set parameters, which I think is what um, block generation are hoping to achieve um on cardano um with their catalyst proposal that they, they have in this upcoming funding round um but yeah i was sort of just make, making ai pieces ad hoc uh, one at a time whenever they were ready and putting them on them it was hiccup nunk at the time um which has since had the plug pulled on it um quite literally from what i hear And I sort of found drawing as a way to uh, absorb myself, really, something I could really focus on um, when things were uh, were quite difficult for me. Um, and I've always had a, a curious nature as well. So I mean, one of the things I was particularly curious about was when I, I think I first saw, it was either CryptoPunks or Bored Ape, um, and that sort of sparked curiosity in me as to how one artist could make 10,000 pieces of art. Um, and it got me thinking about how code, which seemed the logical uh, the logical step for me, um, how code and, and art production could be combined. Um, and this was, it was roughly in parallel with, with how things were developing with my AI work as well. Um, I was sort of considering um, getting my coding skills up to a level where I could develop my own <coughs> uh, AI algorithm. Purely as a hobby, I, I used to just use Python um, mainly um, just to automate small tasks, um, really nothing, nothing too complex. 
Um, I've, I've always had an interest in creating things with computers and building computers. Um, when I was sort of 10, 11, I would stay in the library after school and uh, there was a small group of us that used to code using QBasic. Um, we'd, we'd create games like Snake and just, just generally mess around in QBasic. Um, and really that the hobby is just built. Um, I've made websites on and off for the past few years, you know, nothing, again, nothing too advanced, um, but just all sort of adding to my knowledge of coding and, and the structure of code. Uh, and then more recently, um, <clears throat> I sort of took the opportunity uh, with the success of of Goat Tribe to effect a change of career and um, I've started a master's in computer science and AI um, so I'm, I'm really interested to see where that can take me uh, and how it can influence my art as well. Um, aside from how the value of Ada would change as soon as I started <laughs> earning it as, as my main source of income. Um, it's, it's probably the the level of work and just how um, how much of a uh, not an addiction, but how how sort of involved I would become in it. Um, I've I've never worked so many hours. You know, I work sort of seven days a week whenever I can fit it in. Um, much at the behest of my my family um i absolutely love it but it is it is hard um i was ready for hard work but i'd sort of envisaged more more making art than than running a business essentially there's no real visible support or promotion of the projects and initiatives which are successful within our ecosystem um, which could bring a much wider audience to Cardano. Um, I'd like to think this is this is changing, um, seeing Charles's recent involvement with uh, Clay Nation. Um, but I, I don't know. Um, for all the technical capability we've got, it, it is a major drawback. Um, and the potential of Cardano, what I see, is is remaining potential. It's it's un, untapped and. Uh, of course, there's a knock-on of, of us not having much of a profile outside of the echo chamber, really, I suppose. Um, and that's the unwillingness of, of platforms or perhaps lack of knowledge from platforms um, to promote and report on Cardano NFTs. You know, when we're, we're the, the third blockchain in volume, but there's there's platforms such as crypto slam dap radar um and coin market cap who, pro who provide statistics on nft volume um and they're reporting on you know um polygon solana um even much much smaller i think i saw one reporting um waves nft volume and i wasn't even aware of of waves having nfts but um i mean their volume is is way way below what Cardano is and it's sort of self-perpetuating you know if, if not people are not promoting it outside of Cardano then these platforms are not latching onto it and then in turn fewer people are, uh, are getting exposed to Cardano and and people just I mean we've seen it a lot recently people don't take us seriously um, and I think there's there's certainly an element of complacency within Cardano as well um, and it, it's easy to feel like everything's fine and it's everyone else's problem because we're being told that we're the best um, and we sort of believe it because we're in an eco and in an echo chamber where everybody's saying the same message but the view outside is is very different uh, and there's very little visibility of uh, you know the fantastic art that we have on Cardano outside of the Cardano community and it's it's a massive shame. sort of adapted to the lack of resources but I'd say definitely there's there's a distinct lack of educational resource especially for NFT producers um, you know how do you make an on-chain NFT 
Um, we're reliant again on on creators and community members sharing information with others. But not not only that. Not only do you need to know who to ask, you need the you need the courage to to speak to those people. There's no sort of there's no way you can go to create an on chain collection or find out except for the tools that you need, the languages that are, that are best suited to it. Um, you know, for someone starting out, someone seeing so many collections, such a diverse range of work, not really knowing who in the community is is reliable, um, I can imagine it's very daunting. Um, and it's it's something I'm hoping to to put on my website when the redesign is complete. You know, a couple of articles just bringing together the information that I've gathered from speaking to people like uh, this crazy life and Hookman. Um, who were both really instrumental in me learning how to create on-chain art on Cardano. To reach out to projects really, to, to find someone who's doing or uh, creating work in a similar way to the way that you want to, whether it's on-chain or um, using IPFS, uh, you know, PFP or like a fine art, anything that uses imagery rather than code, just to reach out to the projects that you admire. We are a community, not not a cult as I see it, um, and every, everyone has been very welcoming um, to me, and I, I think they would be, I certainly would be, to newcomers um, looking for advice. Yeah, so uh, for the O collection, which is the one that changes whenever it's it's loaded. Um, I well, I've, I mean, I first started out uh, creating the idea. Um, my background in art programming had been in processing and P five JS, which is a JavaScript framework. Um, both of which are not suited to to on chain NFTs, uh, primarily because of the size. Um, the size limitation of having 16 kilobytes to work with. Um, so it was a matter of finding the right uh, language, which Huckman um, basically told me I need, needed to be using vanilla JavaScript. Um, so once I'd written the JavaScript, I had a, like a, a review process. So I have the JavaScript embedded in an HTML file so I can sort of see what I'm working on as I'm working on it. Um, once that's finalized, um, I went through a process called minification, which makes the JavaScript as small as possible. And then you convert it to base 64 um, and then embed it into the uh, metadata file, which is usually in JSON format. Some of the pieces just have one set of rings, um, which is uh, a sort of a smaller section of code. The rings are all created through for loops. Um, with with one set of rings, there's sort of be maybe three lines of code. Um, for three or five sets of rings, you're going to have three or five times that. Um, so. There's that element. Uh, there's also the the condition uh, element that I've applied. So um, some of the rings have um, like a, a fractured appearance. It's called shattered in the metadata. Um, and to do that, I've used sort of um, different multipliers on the radiuses and done the rings sort of sectionally. So um, again, having one set of rings will be three lines of code having one set of rings with six fractures would be six times three sets of code um so yeah there, there are there are variations within the collection that, that when they when they sort of stack up they sort of exponentially increase the size of of the file first thing was actually understanding what an on-chain NFT is um, and realizing the tools available. Um, I'd used Paul PM's metadata test page previously, 
but it didn't occur to me to to use it in this process so initially i um i created a couple of pieces that were in svg format and wrapped those in an html document um which means that the code isn't technically um on chain and again to test them rather than using the pool website i actually minted them and sent them to myself it was an escape initially i, I sort of mentioned earlier that illustration became a way for me to um, focus uh, and just embed myself in something um, really focus on something when things weren't um, particularly great um, and it was also a way that I could test my theories around combining code and illustration to create mass collections um, like CryptoPunks and Board Ape Yacht Club. Um, um, but yeah, it was just a fun, a fun illustration project in the beginning. Um, and I started, started sharing some images um, sort of behind the scenes with, with people that I was speaking to um, again. People that I met in the in the Entheos uh, Discord actually, um, and and that sort of gave me the the confidence, um, sort of made me consider that it could actually be a a viable collection. Um, so I kept working at it, um, and I, I was lucky enough to meet the the right people to make it a success. Really, um, again, um, the team that I met with through the Entheos channel we are, had an interest uh, and a passion for his work in common um, so we we started talking and then it, it soon became a thing really the, the team aside you know I've got people who are great um, sort of looking after and fostering community and sort of outreach to other projects for, for all of our partnerships. Um, it's not a particular strength of mine. I, I don't market um, well. I don't really speak to people that I don't know um, particularly well. Um, I'm, I certainly don't see myself as a figurehead or, or the face of a project. Um, but the way the community came together um, is is not something I can take credit for. Um, it's to me, it's it's just the coming together of the right bunch of people. I mean, perhaps um, the slow mint that we had. Uh, you know, it took two weeks to sell out. Which, thinking about it realistically, is not um, is not a negative thing. It's you know, I mean there's such an emphasis on projects to sell out quickly because momentum is such a big thing in this in this field and there's going to be another project that comes along in a few days and sort of you know steal your momentum and you're relying on a lot of people coming in and and really um connecting with each other and connecting with the art um and that's what they did really so we, i mean we sort of had two weeks and rather than people leave and move on to the next thing they they kept minting and as the mint kept going on people people kept coming in but the people that were there from the beginning kept buying more as well it can be very difficult it was quite a challenging time for me um but thankfully again i had the team around me um th there were people in our community calling out for us to stop the mint and burn the remaining pieces and um you, you try not to build up any expectations but when we sort of opened the gates i think 700 well, was it it was either 400 pieces in the first seven minutes or 700 in the first four minutes when they when they fly out like that then you you suddenly get you know very excited um and then things slowed slowed right down um and yeah, it was it was a struggle, definitely a struggle. Um, I think it was probably beneficial to us that there weren't lots and lots of projects releasing at that time. I know when Ada came 
probably was at its peak. You know, there were several projects releasing a day, um, and I think it's it's probably a lot less than that now. And I don't think it was quite at that level when we when we released. My father is French, um, and I, I really like how the phrase rolls off the, off the tongue um, and sounds a bit like Orteca, which is um, a band that I am a, a fan of, or I should say electronic music duo. Uh, they're not really, can't really call themselves a band, but they make generative music. Um, and it means uh, means other heart. Um, so it's sort of fit, fit for me because it was, it was a passion. Um, it was, it's built around a passion that I have for art, um, whereas I have other passions, you know, I've got family and um, music being another passion. So it's sort of um, sort of a, a synonym for my other passion, if you see what I mean. Um, and I, I wanted a pseudonym, um, as an, particularly as non anonymity seemed important to me early on. Um, and I sort of did like the idea of being faceless, uh, allowing the art to speak for itself rather than uh, being attached to to a person, I suppose. It started out as as just an exercise, really, um, in using loops to to create shapes. Um, but the, the rings quickly became, uh, they quickly came to represent the grooves of, rec of a record um, for me. And and then the idea to sort of build the color schemes around um, records that have been instrumental in my, in my life or, you know, <laughs> in creating who I am as a person, it seemed, seemed to really fit. Um, and work with with the concept well, um, and it has it has really helped. Um, you know, I've got a, as everyone does, I have a lot of albums which mean a lot to me. Um, they're not necessarily my favourite albums, but they've had an impact on my life. So it seemed a good way for me to pay homage to those to those records um, at a time when when my appreciation for music and my ability to appreciate music was changing um it was yeah it really helps with me it really helped me to reconnect although it's sort of a core concept of the collection I, I i did think that the music element of it would be sort of ancillary and people would would be more focused on the art it's been really interesting to see people um discovering music through it and it's it's fantastic that i've been able to share um my most influential records in this way my taste in music was probably shaped a lot by um my first time at university uh, when i went to study music and music technology which um helped in itself um my father also listens to a lot of abstract music and jazz. So I gained awareness of a lot of artists and different sounds. I was exposed to a lot of different music uh, as a child. And when I got to university, I remember um, I was in university accommodation and it was one of the first days I was there. Someone two doors down from me had their door open and they were listening to Square Pusher. Um, and it just, it, it amazed me because I, I had a, you know, an appreciation for musicianship. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know, Square Pusher is, uh, is an incredible bass player um, who creates electronic music uh, in, a similar, in a similar vein to Aphex Twin, uh, I suppose would be more mainstream, um, relative artist. Um, and just hearing that coming out of out of that room, it just, it, that was the start of it really. It really opened me up. Um, and then I was sort of led into um, Aphex Twin um, as part of my studies. Uh, three or six 
um, pieces per record. Um, a lot of that was driven by the um, variation in the resulting pieces that I could get from the colours in the record sleeves. So a lot of the sets of three um, come from um, record sleeves, which just have a couple of colours. Uh, there are a couple where I went to extra effort to try and push the boundaries of just two or three colours in a record sleeve to, to fill a full set of six, and that was because of how much I enjoyed the album. Sort of sad in a way, really. Um, I don't particularly have a favourite album at the moment. Um, previously, I would have would have probably answered either Diorama by Silverchair or um, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness by Smashing Pumpkins. There, there are a number of elements to each image, um, such as the number of rings, for example. Um, and this is driven by um, a variable that's taken from a handful of options. So you're either going to have 33, 45 or 78 rings. Some pieces also have multipliers that are selected randomly on top of that as well. Um, but the values of these variables uh, are set when the image is generated or when the picture is loaded. So um, the program sort of picks values for these things when it's loaded and that's what defines how the image looks. Um, for me, I, initially I liked the idea of a piece of art which was always different when it was viewed, um, but it would obviously have to have some characteristics so you'd know it's, these were iterations of one piece and this one piece is part of a larger collection that that sort of feeling of coherence was quite important to me. Um, uh, but it's, it's sort of come to represent a way for the user to experience the art in the way, in a similar way to how they would experience a musical performance. Um, so the piece effectively is performing for the, the owner um, in a way that uh, an artist would create music and they, you know, they play a song from their album, but it'd be slightly different every time. There's, there's, you know, there's nuances in performance, there's ways the instruments are tuned, there's slight variations in speed. Um, there's drummers who go crazy and decide to do a, a solo in the middle of the piece. Um, uh, you know, and th there's also background noise. If you're listening to a record, you know, the, the environment that you're in affects how it sounds, um, whether you're listening to it on vinyl, whether you're listening to it on Spotify, uh, and where you are when you're listening. To it. These are all ways that impact um, the, the way that the music is heard, and I wanted to try and recreate that uh, visually. Colours they do change, um, and that's through the way that the layers interact with each other. So the, the first layer is a base color, and then the, there's a set of circles on top of that, um, usually centered at the edges or the corners of the pieces, and they are solid color. Um, and I use an aspect called blend mode, which um, changes how the way colors react with each other when they overlap. So the background circles, um, usually have randomized radiuses so they can cross over to to varying degrees or not at all um, and the blend mode <clears throat> will sort of impact the color created at these crossover points which often creates different shapes like you'll see some pieces have almost like a flower um, shape um, and other pieces have like an eye shape in the middle of them that's just created by circles overlapping um, but each piece has a fixed uh, condition, whether it's mint, shattered, um, warped. I've got um, the versions which are split diagonally, split vertically, horizontally, um, and they have a fixed number of rings as well. Um, so you've either got a piece with one, two, three, um, and in rarer cases, four or five sets of rings. 
uh, and that's fixed per piece. Oh, well, to put it bluntly, they, uh, they saw some earlier versions of O oh, that I was sharing on Twitter and um, Adam jumped into my Discord and offered offered their minting services. Um, I had a, had a call with him shortly afterwards um, and I got a really good, really good feeling about them. Um, we, we seem to hit it off, you know, I, I really like the plans that they've got for blockchain. Um, and of course, seeing the work of Charles and, and Huckman, the previous collections that they've, they've minted and uh, the ongoing mint that Huckman has as well with the, uh, the block clocks. Aside from uh, illustration, I'm, I'm working on a new, new collection for Goat Tribe. Um, I have a collaboration with Forms, which is going to be on-chain, um, which is essentially coded. I um, need to go over a few things and figure out how the minting of that is going to work. Um, because the collection uses um, data based on where we are in the epoch, uh, which epoch we're in. Um, and that influences the piece that comes out. Um, and as I say, they'll be on chain as well. And that's quite near completion. Um, and uh, there's sort of a, a theme emerging in my pieces, which sort of ties together with forms. And there's there's quite a circular element um, to each, uh, to the collection. Um, it, the pieces essentially feature two two orbs which uh, start at a point and throughout the epoch they swap positions um, and they get bigger towards the middle of the epoch and smaller um, as the epoch draws to a close um, and they also have like a sort of a starburst effect uh, that we're working to animate um, as well and the, the sort of extent of the starburst is dependent on on which slot the epoch is currently in as well.